Good morning, and thank you for inviting the European Union to um, this year's ABAS, or ABARES, as we are fond of calling it in Europe. Uh, in Europe, we're very proud of our uh, food safety and of the traceability of what our farmers uh, produce, what we call our uh, farm-to-fork uh, uh, approach to controls. Uh, I want this morning to flip the phrase around and talk more about the fork to the farm, uh, what uh, European consumers and society are uh, expecting and demanding uh, from uh, their farmers, and how the, uh, the regulators are in turn responding to that uh, demand. And I'll be uh, presenting the results of some recent uh, very extensive uh, consumer surveys um, carried out in the EU recently. But first, a bit of context. Uh, let me say a few words about the EU agricultural sector. It's a big sector. 22 million people depend on farming and food. The average farm size is uh, 16 hectares only. Uh, but that, of course, um, disguises very, very large uh, variations in size. It's a little bit like the, uh, the man who put his, his head in a hot oven and his feet in the freezer, and as a result, he's an average temperature. Uh, in in uh, the EU, we have some very, very large arable farms uh, in, in east of England, in, in northern France, in the, uh, those uh, uh, eastern countries that were collectivized. But we have many millions of very, very small farms. The majority are of three, four, five, six hectares only. And our farmers produce for um, 500 million plus uh, EU consumers and many more around the world. The, the EU Common Agricultural Policy, the CAP, was the first EU-wide uh, policy put in place uh, 60 years ago so as to guarantee Europe's food security. The policy has been massively reformed in the last 20 years, making EU agriculture uh, quite globally competitive in many areas, very much market-oriented and focused on, on consumer demands, and I'll say more about that later. Our farming and food also has a very good reputation for sustainability, quality, food safety, and innovation. And as a result of our market uh, reforms of agriculture, the EU is now the world's biggest exporter as well as importer of agricultural products. And EU household expenditure on food and drinks is now running at 1,000 billion euros a year and growing. I mention these, these figures not purely for academic reasons, but because our market size, our position in international trade, and our international reputation means that our agricultural and food policies have a, a global impact. Not only are we, are we increasingly price makers, but in many cases the standards that Europe sets become the global standards for food safety and traceability. We've heard uh, this week in the conference about um, some of the, the drivers or global uh, trends. Uh, I want to highlight uh, for, for today's purpose three major trends which are driving policy and also farmers' decisions uh, in Europe and around the world. The first is growing and, and shifting uh, food demand. Uh, more food has to be produced to feed growing and urbanized populations. The, de the, the demand for the food mix is, is shifting. In developed countries, there's a trend towards a more healthy diet and a slight decline in meat consumption. Whereas in emerging economies, people, as they have more income, it's a kind of a food uh, Kuznets curve, want a more varied diet, richer in animal proteins and, and sugar, but also fruits and vegetables. Second big trend, and, and Senator Rustin mentioned this, pressure on natural resources, which means that farmers have to produce more food in a more sustainable way, for example, using far less water and minimizing the use of fertilizers which damage soil quality. And the third big driver, of course, is, is climate change, which creates new pressures and uncertainties and volatility for agricultural production. Agriculture can no longer be outside the debate, and meeting the Paris climate targets will require a massive effort from farmers in Europe, Australia, and all over. And all of these mega trends, if you like, are, are reflected also in European consumers' expectations about farming and food. And I want to uh, move now to uh, look at what um, European consumers demand and expect uh, from their food and from their farmers, and how governments are uh, responding to this and how farmers are responding.
all our surveys have shown that there, there are four essential things which European consumers and society are seeking uh, from the food they buy and consume. First of all, they want food that is safe and healthy. Uh, in a, a, a recent survey, um, seven out of 10 uh, European consumers indicated that they are very, very worried, very worried by pesticide residues in fruits, vegetables, and cereals, and the use of antibiotics or hormones in meat. It's very paradoxical. Uh, food in Europe has never been safer, yet, uh, paradoxically, uh, the concerns have never been greater. We need to make a distinction, of course, between safe food and healthy food. Safety is the duty of the regulator, and for that reason we have in Europe and in Australia high standards on residues, on animal disease control, on biosecurity. And we also reflect uh, societal demands under the precautionary approach, such as Europe's tough policy on uh, GMOs or our prohibition on hormone-free, hormone-fed uh, meat. And our decision-making uh, processes in, 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 in a democratic society must not only recognize scientific arguments about food safety, but also public opinion and social expectations. And to come back to a point I made at the start, due to our market size and sophistication, the EU uh, in some respects is becoming a, a standard setter in many areas of food uh, safety. I give one example, Russia, India and China have all followed our example in banning the use of hormones uh, as, a, as a growth promoter uh, in beef. Uh, similarly, our position on, on uh, use of antibiotics uh, is being followed more and more by uh, many other countries. Healthy food is a more uh, moving target, I would say. It may be driven by the market, given a, a nudge by regulators, or be regulated uh, uh, clean, cleanly. Uh, take the example of uh, sugar content, quite uh, controversial in Europe these days. I went to a conference uh, a few months ago entitled Sugar, the Next Tobacco, which says it all. Um, this can be regulated by um, government uh, through, through labeling requirements, or uh, as is largely the case in the EU at the moment, it can be uh, dr driven uh, more by the uh, producers, by the private sector through labeling and other forms of consumer uh, information. Uh, we are seeing in Europe today um, soda taxes being introduced in several EU countries, and the industry is rapidly um, adjusting to that uh, reality. Uh, for example, the EU soft drinks industry has um, announced that voluntarily it will stop selling soft drinks uh, containing added sugars uh, to European schools uh, as from next year. That's one example. The second um, thing that European consumers are asking from their food and from their farmers, according to the, our recent surveys, is that they want food which is produced in a sustainable and environmentally sound way. Um, last year's Eurobarometer survey uh, showed that uh, um, after uh, poverty and terrorism, uh, climate change is seen by the EU citizen as the most, third most serious global uh, problem. Young people in the EU, the millennials and others, uh, particularly care about environment and climate change, and that affects their buying decisions. EU consumers want food produced using fewer inputs, for example, pesticides, and production methods which respect nature. And we're seeing this, uh, among other things, in the very, very um, rapid increase in organic food production in Europe. Uh, in the last decade, uh, the amount of land turned over to organics has increased by half a million hectares a year. That is quite uh, a staggering uh, growth. The same debate is also driving the, the, um, or the same concerns, I would say, are also driving the debate in Europe about the use of uh, palm oil. And perhaps our colleague will, from, from the Indonesian think tank will be able to say a little bit about that uh, later. Um, and our surveys also show that the European public <coughs> expect agriculture to contribute to climate change mitigation and our greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction uh, targets. And for that reason, there is massive support in Europe for using taxpayers' money to give farmers income support to be used to protect the environment and uh, manage climate change.
The third uh, big concern uh, or priority of EU consumers is animal welfare. Our consumers are, are wealthy enough to care. They are, if you like, at the top of the Maslow um, pyramid in this respect. And our survey from last year showed that around 60% of, of uh, households are ready to pay more for products which have been sourced from animal welfare friendly production systems. And more than half of our citizens, this is quite an extraordinary figure, more than half of our citizens actually look for animal welfare labeling when buying products. We have, I think, the, the, among the highest animal welfare requirements in the world. And uh, here again, we are, I think, a benchmark for others. The, I, I follow the debate on animal welfare standards in the United States, and I think they are about 10, 12 years behind us in this debate. And there's a message here for our future FTA partners like Australia. If your agricultural products can meet um, equivalent animal welfare standards as ours, there'll be much more a ready acceptance of those products uh, on the European uh, market. Interestingly, our survey also showed that there's a, in, in the EU, there's a difference between Protestant and Catholic countries on animal welfare, with Protestant countries being far more sensitive to animal welfare issues than Catholic countries. I leave the, the clerics in the audience to try to work out uh, the reason for that difference. And the fourth uh, priority for European consumers is on the origin and the composition of what they eat. Uh, this is really, really at the heart of the uh, European uh, consumer concerns. As I said earlier, traceability is one of the great um, selling points of European food. And a good, good example of this is geographical indications. More and more consumers are looking for authenticity, local products. And GIs answer consumers increasing interest to have information on the origin of the product, to get a guarantee on the way that the product is, is produced, and a guarantee on quality and taste. And we found in the surveys that uh, typically uh, a GI product commands uh, two to three times the price of a comparable non-GI product, and consumers are ready to pay that, uh, that very large uh, premium. Now, uh, one measure of the um, success of GIs in Europe is the extent to which they are being uh, copied, counterfeited, uh, usurped uh, by uh, others. Here are some examples, um, humorous examples perhaps, um, bored dough, uh, goat, goat roti, uh, feta. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I, I, I put this slide in to lighten the mood a little bit, but, you know, there is a serious issue behind this because usurpation of, of iconic European GI names is on an industrial uh, scale. Uh, we estimate that about 80% of the, of the Bordeaux found on the sale in China is actually not the real, uh, the, the real thing. And, and uh, I, I, I would add that the use of European GI names is also going to be an issue for our future FTA with Australia. So what next? Where is Europe going uh, in, this, um, in this debate? We, we are now embarking on a, a new uh, major reform of our common agricultural um, policy. Um, it's called the future of food and farming, so not just farming. We're looking at the whole of the uh, agriculture and food sector in a very holistic way. Um, the next uh, cap, common agricultural policy, will have to reflect even more uh, consumers' and societies' demands. That means, first of all, continuing the, the, the march, the market orientation of the last uh, 15 years so that farmers uh, continue to decide what to produce uh, as a business decision, as entrepreneurs, and that they're not producing uh, because of government uh, uh, fiat about, about what they should produce. Secondly, the, the next uh, common agricultural policy will include uh, rules and incentives for farmers to meet the EU's very ambitious uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation targets. And thirdly, financial support to farmers will increasingly be tied to uh, ensuring food safety and sustainability. That means in practice support to compensate for the higher production costs of meeting high environmental standards, reducing the use of pesticides and fertilizers, the continued prohibition of uh, growth hormones and antibiotics as growth promoters, and meeting uh, increasingly strict uh, animal welfare standards. 
uh, it's um, only fair to pay for these public goods, and the uh, European taxpayers are, uh, according to our surveys, extremely willing to, to, to have their tax money uh, sent to farmers to provide some support for them to meet these additional production costs. So to, to sum up, and I'm finishing, Europe, I think, is, is regarded as a, a leader in, in safe, sustainably produced, and quality food. Other regions are likely to continue to follow our regulatory decisions. We are um, increasing a, a value setter. And unlike uh, Las Vegas, what happens in Europe doesn't always stay in Europe. Thank you very much.